Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sherke Tulda. That's me, just like the CubeSats before, and then I get my hair cut, so I'm like a pocket cube, smaller than head. Uh, so I wanted to first talk about what has, done, what has been done with the Delphi PQ. Then, actually, I changed my mind. Uh, because I would like to talk something more important, but I will come to that later on at the end of the presentation. And I also would like to apologize if I yawn in the middle of my presentation. I have just came back from Japan and I'm still like extremely jet lagged. So my apologies. Now, so yeah. Okay, uh, let's start. And I can not. Okay, so some of the things you need to use your imagination on the left hand side. Uh, so I will first talk about Delphi Space. So in TUDELF we have this entity called Delphi Space. So basically we are in charge of building the satellites, uh, instruments, or the testing. So anything that as TUDELF we would like to send it to space, we do it together under the name of Delphi Space. It was established in 2012. Uh, so yeah, we launched our first satellite Delphi C3 in 2009, second one in 2012 Delphi Next, and 2020 to Delphi PQ. Unfortunately, at the beginning of November, Delphi C3 the orbit. So right now we are left with two satellites and Delphi PQ will the orbit uh, shortly in January. So why did we decide to go smaller with respect to the pocket cubes? We wanted to push the boundaries. Uh, because CubeSat was like saturating in, the, in terms of development of the CubeSat itself, not the scientific instruments. So there were enough companies and we thought as a university we need to try something different and then maybe enable more technologies later on. Another thing was cost and development as most of you have developed a, a pocket cube at least, you know that it's actually way cheaper than a CubeSat and then launching it is also cheaper than a CubeSat. We are, but the challenges stay the same. And again, funding schemes was another problem because uh, CubeSats were becoming, at least for the Netherlands, not a means for the university to use as an educational tool directly to get a funding. They were like encouraging companies to build it while the universities should focus something else. That was the point. So uh, what is a PQ? As we all know, by now it's five by five by five and yet another satellite standard, so hopefully there will not be a new one for the next 10 years, maybe. And this is from the mechanical standard that we have all developed as the community. And this is the photo that I like. I didn't do this, the cringy thing. This is from uh, Bob Twix. When he first talked about uh, pocket cubes, he actually used this in his slides. And then his reasoning was like, it fits in your pocket, so let's just call it a pocket cube. And then the first pocket cube was launched in 2013, as we celebrate the 10th year uh, already. And it was called with multiple names, Bakersat, Eagle One, Mac Pocket Cube, SV. So it was 2.5P pocket cube. And since then, as Tom also stated, there is more than 80. And I think with the planned and the canceled ones, it's uh, around 100 pocket cubes, which were like conceptualized at one point or another. So uh, the Alpha PQ, this was our satellite, the 3P1 that we launched in 2021. It was a 3P pocket cube uh, with the volume, power, and the, this was the expected cost, but later on, of course, it never fits in the budget. And uh, we launched this. Uh, the team was mostly me and Stefano Speretta, as you can see, and then rest of our team is also us, so if you need any information, please feel free to approach us. And this is the internal of our satellite. So this is the actual flight model. We have developed everything in-house. And then, unfortunately, the GPS didn't arrive in time due to COVID. So they delivered it one week before uh, that we had to bring it to the ALB orbital. Here, I will just mention some of the key things. This is our ADCS that we never turned it on because we didn't have time to write the software. But the satellite works even without it anyway. This in the middle is our uh, laser reflectors. So I think in this month, uh, some people from ILRS are going to try to track it and then try to position it. And yeah, so what we have developed for the pocket cube was like, we wanted to make it 
more scalable and faster to develop. So we came up with the idea to standardize the core. So basically same MCU, same DC-DC converter, same chips for the core of every subsystem. And for every subsystem, we were just adding the extra functionality. So by doing this, uh, I think last year when we needed to develop uh, the satellite, every one month we were just producing the new flight version of every subsystem. So right now, if you want a new satellite from me, I can get it done in six months and deliver it. I'm not trying to sell it to you, I'm just trying to explain the pocket cubes development phase. So, and then here I'm trying to build up for the topic that I really want to talk about. We switch from cubes as the pocket cubes, not only me as the community, multiple people also did it. And we were thinking like, what could be the differences and the similarities? So we always talk about pocket cube is cheaper, pocket cube is like easier to develop, but it all depends on what we would like to do. So some of the main key differences are, for example, yes, pocket cube gets smaller, but it actually becomes denser. And our satellite was still half, uh, I mean, mostly empty. But still, uh, with respect to the standard, this is what it becomes. And as you develop the subsystems, you see that some components doesn't exist for you to go even smaller. So another key point was like, yes, this is smaller, but most of the regulations stay the same. So just because you made it smaller, it doesn't mean that it's easier. In most aspects, it actually gets more difficult. For example, protection requirements are the same. So you still need to comply with those with respect to the launch provider. And then in this example, for example, we don't have a deployer from ISS, but if you want to go through ISS, all of our batteries need to have a different protection scheme. Again, yeah, these are like the launch requirements, separation switches, deployment switches, and RBFs. As I remember the very first discussion that we had years ago for the first or the second pocket cube workshop, we were actually talking a lot with other people. How do you do your separation switch? How do you make sure that your satellite is off during the deployment, at least the, during the transit? And yeah, so even if we get the satellite smaller, the minimum functionality is still always there. You still need a microcontroller. You still need to like regulate the power. And those things are currently in the OK level. But we hope that things will get smaller, especially on the protection side. So this is the, another important part. Yes, satellite gets smaller, but the radiation stays the same. And then we, with all satellites, need to survive this. So this is just another thing to consider. And some of the challenges as we come to the next satellite, for example, that we are facing, we have these nice ideas we would like to do, but the, since the pocket cubes use way too less power, some of the protection circuits or the IC is actually not useful for us. So another challenging approach might be to develop some new ICs that we can use in the pocket cubes. And this is just an example for our cost and development. When we were manufacturing the flight version, we were just manufacturing five of each board. And these are all hand-soldered in the office together with Stefano. And then we just created this huge batch. We actually launched one satellite in space. And you know that even if you manufacture five, at least one of them will never work. So personal approach, please design more than one every time you do it. And then. What if we want to get smaller? Let's say one piece, I don't know if some of you remember when the, we were, they were about to launch the first 5P, sorry, 1P pocket cubes. Some people were like, hey, we cannot track those. They are just, a, how do you say, more like a bomb in space that we cannot track. So we had to, Stefano has a study actually with that where he was proving that you can actually track them. But pretty much the 1P is the limit. If you go smaller than that, uh, it became just a debris or almost impossible to track. So what do we say for the pocket community? We were always like, leave it the way you like to find it. This is for the orbit, not for something else. And uh, smaller satellites are basically harder to detect. And we saw this with uh, multiple satellite launches. You can see that the TLEs for us to get a correct one takes actually longer than a normal CubeSat. And then we were thinking about what we can do. We can do an RF tracking, uh, GPS tracking, and uh, laser ranging. So we are trying to do this uh, step by step. And for our next satellites, we would like to incorporate all of these. And then just to show this is what we are aiming to increase the trackability. So uh, what are we looking for? Oh, sorry. 
Uh, yes, we would like to make it smaller, but at what cost? So like functionality, are we giving up on functionality? Well, if we do that, then pocket cubes will lose their edge, at least like, then they will be like, why should I launch a pocket cube instead of a CubeSat? And this is just a really, uh, really, really early image of the subsystems that we develop and trying to fit everything in the structure or see how it feels like. Yes, we can make it smaller, but then detectability and trackability becomes a huge issue. And lately, if you notice, uh, even the European Space Agency just published the new debris mitigation uh, handbook, and there are a lot of regulations, so like your satellite needs to deorbit after its end of life, sorry, it needs to deorbit in five years, you cannot go higher than certain altitude, you need to show your reliability. I would like to ask if any of you did an actual reliability study on their pocket cube. And even if you did, can you show that its reliability is 0 0.9, which is not that easy to do? Uh, launch requirements. As we said, satellites get smaller, but the launch requirements stay the same. So whatever we do, we still need to comply with everything, even if it's small or big. So what's the sweet spot then? So it's basically the mission requirements, what you would like to achieve, or what we would like to achieve all together as the Pocket Cube community. And now, I would like to jump back a little bit and then ask some opinions or what do you feel about those. So I think everybody knows this. Is there anyone who doesn't know this one? I'm not gonna grade you. You can just say yes or no easily. So, so this is the Sputnik. And why do we remember this? Very first satellite. What about these ones? Do you know any of these satellites? So they were the first CubeSats to be launched. These six, they were deployed all together. And as you can see, none of you remember. For all of us, it just looks like another cube from now on. But these were like, I think, uh, 2003, if I'm not mistaken. And what about these ones? Some of them you might remember, but these were the first pocket cubes that were launched. So this is the Moorhead, $50 Cube Scout, and we ran. So as you can see, like this is easy to know, I guess. So James Webb Space Telescope. It's not a pocket cube, just a reminder, and it's really big. So, but with the same amount of money, we can have one pocket cube per person on the planet almost, sorry, per institution, not a person. And these ones, yeah, Starling, or maybe in the future, some pocket cubes that flying all together. This one, everybody knows, this is so easy to spot, even at night, so this is the International Space Station for us, of course. And these are the fanciest CubeSats of all, the first interplanetary CubeSats that have the latest landing and then they actually worked. So you know that for the CubeSats, they have the tendency not to work. So it's not about your design or your mistake, it's just the satellites themselves, so don't feel bad. And this one, I still remember the first day that I was watching the SpaceX landing. It was so exciting for me. But now, what do you remember from all of those? Do you still watch every SpaceX uh, landing? Do you still have the same excitement? Some of you nerds have it. But, I mean, most of us, it's just, yeah, they launched, they landed, okay, congratulations, so. I'm not undermining their work, it's just like, becomes like the mainstream. Of course, it's a huge achievement. So, we remember these, some of them, because they are the first ones, or they are some unique or weird missions. But again, it's not the same excitement, even if you see it now, so. So, where are we with the pocket cubes? We have a mechanical standard, so at least we can fit in the same a deployer and deploy cheaply. Hope that price will go down. This is not a statement or to any company, so. Uh, some of, there are some electrical standards, like multiple ones. I think when I checked, I found like four uh, electrical standards for the pocket cubes. Uh, we have multiple companies. I think the pocket cubes, just like the CubeSats are also in that phase that multiple companies are popping up and then developing maybe different concepts or different uh, business cases. We have multiple launch providers, so it's not that hard to go to space if you have the money. And 
the best one. So now we have more recognition. And when I say we, it's not to yourself, it's like whoever wants to build a pocket cube or something smaller. As you know, uh, the ESA Flyer satellite is now up. The call, I think, is still on. Uh, and this year, if you read here, they say, yeah, the program now welcomes applications for 1, 2, 1P, 2P, and 3P pocket cubes. So this means more recognition in the international area. And then for those who would like to get the help, I will stop for a second. So this is the QR code for the ESA Flyer satellite. A web page, you can go there, see the regulations, the rules, requirements, how to apply, what to do. So just let me know when done. I'm not promising any launch, by the way. You still have to go through their process, so I'm just showing you the link. Okay, now I would like to switch to a more interactive approach. I would like to ask, what comes to your mind when I say the pocket cubes? You don't need to be philosophical, just be relaxed and be yourself. Anybody who would like to contribute? Inexpensive. Sorry? Inexpensive. Okay, inexpensive. Can I get two more? Anyone? Educational tool. Educational tool? Cheaper. Cheaper. Yeah, we can see you're from the same company. Great. So, okay, uh, we talked about this already. As we said, there are now, even with the idea phase, there are approximately 100 pocket cubes ranging from 1P to 3P. And most of them are still inst institutional, but almost half of them uh, are like Albo Orbital and other companies. Why are you building them? So this is for every group that I would like to ask who has designed a pocket cube or who is making the new one. Why? What's your reason? Okay, challenge and the potential profit. Technical advancement, pushing the boundaries. Okay, technical advancement, pushing the boundaries. Anyone else? You just build it because you can afford it? Because it's fun. Okay, yes, that's also the one case. I think it's about training the 21st century workforce. Yeah, that's also a nice approach, especially f for like the institutional developers. That's actually one of our goals to provide it as an also educational tool or think as it a in-orbit laboratory for students to actually experience. Anyone else? Or I will continue. Okay. And what did you gain from them so far with your satellites? So would you like to start since you have a couple already in space? Okay, yeah. What we learned is if you think space is hard, you misunderstood. It's way harder than you could possibly imagine. Yeah, okay. A nice approach. Uh, is the Romanian team here? They were like, from last year, there were some high school students who were building it. Okay, so I will, we will question them later on. And so, yeah, anyone? Sorry, I don't know everyone personally who builds it. Yeah? We learned how not to build it. Yes, great. That's actually, we learn by burning stuff. I remember when I was a student, I burned a battery system, and I was from Turkey. And with the exchange rate, when you announced this to your professor, I saw him, he was almost fainting because I burned the battery system. So yeah. What would you like to do more? So like, yes, advancement. Where do you want to advance? What's your end point? More data. Okay, more data, so you can see the science nerd at the front seat, this one. Reliability. Li sorry? Reliability. Yeah, okay, reliability. You are here for a reason, yeah? Standardization. Standardization, okay, that's a nice approach which we never tackled with the pocket cube since the first mechanical standard. That's a nice thing to, nice topic to come. Okay, some of the things are going into repetition, but what were your challenges? The most nice one or the annoying one? Regulatory. Yes, of course.
we always forget that one. So don't forget to register your frequencies, I'm telling to everyone. Deadlines. Sorry? Deadlines. Deadlines. Deadlines, yes, yes. Unfortunately, the rocket launches never wait, and you never have the satellite in time. It's like doing your homework, you wait till the last day, and then you sleep, you think that you will make it in the morning, and then, yep, your ADCS is not there, as for our example. So, um, where do we go from here? So this is the part where I change my, actually, this is the part, the reason why I change all the rest of my slides. So while I was in Japan, we were discussing of possibilities. So there, there's a consortium called University Space Engineering Consortium, and then we try to come up with the ways how we can make it a more educational tool or how we can push the CubeSats into more interplanetary for the universities and like trying to come up with ideas. And I will come to that, and that's the reason why I changed my slides. So I will start with an example. Uh, how many of you know QB50? Three, four, five. Okay, so QB50 was a mission led by VKI, Von Karman Institute in Belgium. So the idea was actually launch at least 50 CubeSats with specific payload. So every institution builds their own CubeSat. You just need to follow a regulation, sorry, some requirements with respect to the data that you are collecting and sharing. And then you had to fly a certain payload. Rest of the satellite, whatever you do, it was uh, up to you. The launch was provided by the, how do you say? the consortium, and then all you need to do is just develop your satellite and do a tiny contribution for the mission if you can. And basically they started with 50, then the number went up all the way to something 80, in the end I think 27, 36 were launched, and then it's because like the launcher was changed, rules changed for the batteries, and then some people had to drop out because they couldn't afford the new battery system. So, and these are the instruments that flew on the CubeSats, uh, for the QB50 CubeSats. So this is a mass spectrometer, uh, FIPEX, I still don't know what this does. And then this is a multi-needle Langmuir probe. So I was a part of two QB50 satellites where we had to fly these things. So where am I trying to go with this? So for me, I think we're at the point that just building the cube, pocket cubes is not enough. Now it's like, wh what are you building it for? Okay, yes, we are demonstrating. Yes, it's a technological tool or educational tool, but where we would like to go or like how much of it of the satellite is actually useful for the bigger community. So we need a mission or maybe a constellation. And we need payloads just like QB50. I'm not saying that we have it right now, but this is where we should go. So what I am proposing is, again, I don't have the money or the means for it, so. But if we actually get together, make some standards and regulations in between us for a new constellation and then develop multiple satellites, at this point I also would like to invite any of you, if you know any person who doesn't build satellites but who's into more physics or chemistry or something else that would like to try something in space or things that a certain set of data that we can collect might be useful. Since the pocket cubes that we are developing are cheaper, relatively depends what you want to do, but we can actually launch, let's say, if every institution, instead of let's say, uh, launching three Ps, if you launch one Ps each, so like the two that will have three, in Hungary you will have three satellites at least, and then we can accumulate enough satellites to create like a sensor node in space where all of us collects all the data all together and then we share it in the community and then we just publish all together. And this is like to create a bigger use case for all the pocket cubes because as the regulations are also getting difficult, licensing is also becoming more difficult. It's going to be just more, more and more challenging to do something alone. Because then, for example, even to IRU, when you apply for a frequency, you need to explain what the amateurs are getting out of this. 
Yeah, and then not every time we have enough ideas that the uh, amateur radio community can actually use your satellite. So now it becomes more and more difficult. And for most of the institutions, it's not economical to actually just buy a license for a certain frequency then because you pay almost as much as your satellite to get a certain frequency. But if we get all together, we can actually create this. So what I'm saying is that we should, maybe for the next book workshop or since I have plenty of time, I can bother some of you now. Uh, new applications, maybe miniaturize some of the scientific instruments, or we make new ones. Uh, just as an example, at TUDEV, this is what we were trying to do. We were trying to, currently we are trying to come up with multiple uh, payloads that we can actually, let's say, fit in a pocket cube with low power consumption, so that uh, our goal is maybe if we build uh, reliable enough and then let's say more modular enough we can actually share this payload with multiple satellites uh, don't get me wrong we are not asking you to collect data for us and if you don't you don't have to do it but this is just the beginning if we just provide more use case for the real world applications then we can actually get more support or still uh, keep our support and then not to be kicked out since we are like way too small satellites and then we are just a debris or something so we are working on this, and I also would like to invite every institution to work on specific payloads that can actually help for some measurements in a more different way. I'm too much of an engineer, so I'm not a person like, oh, if you measure this, it would be nice. But if you tell me I want to measure this, and I have this thing, can you make it smaller, or can you make a new one? That I can provide. Yeah, um, my recommendation is founding a working group. This can be, again, another Facebook group or an emailing group that we just talk about these. Nothing else, warning you from the beginning. It will be kicked out of the group if you talk about something else. Um, and then later on, we can build our constellation. This is not going to happen, of course, in one year. But if we start talking now, maybe in the next five years or for the, let's say, for the second 10 years of the pocket cubes, we can actually say, hey, we actually launch this many pocket cubes all together and then we contributed this data. One thing, again, not to talk negatively about the QB50, most satellites failed. So in the end, uh, we weren't able to get so much data out of the QB50. So there is still this nice opportunity to launch a big constellation developed by multiple entities and then just provide the data to everyone. And if interested, please feel free to send me an email. Uh, I'm okay to uh, start the initiative and then later on, uh, okay to hand it over to someone else. So the idea is basically first to come up with payloads and then the second step is how we can make sure that this becomes a new constellation. Of course, this means writing proposals. Uh, it can be another funding scheme inside Europe or if anybody knows a rich person that they would like to fund a project, please feel free to approach your friends. Yeah, so exactly. Uh, so yeah, so I'm at the end of my presentation. So at this point, I would like to get your opinion on what you think about the Pocket Cube constellation. Would you be interested or if you see any challenges or problems or anything that you would like to say about it, please feel free. Uh, I would like to end with the image that this is everything that we built for our 3P pocket cube. And it was during COVID, so uh, this is our lab in the university. And then at some point it was in my living room with a high electricity bill because of trying everything else. And feel free to reach us on the other means. So thank you for listening for now. And I would like to open the discussion for anybody who would like to say even against the constellation, I'm okay, you don't have to support it. Just feel free to speak your mind, I will say.
in mind one thing. When you were talking about licenses, actually, QB50 was handled very differently. Uh, most of the cubes that were university driven, so they were considered part of education, this actually was handled separately by Yari. Uh, we, there was a committee, we were basically coordinating all the satellites together in order to sort this problem out. Okay. One of the things that probably went wrong in that process was that it was extremely quick. So, oh, we get everybody got the frequencies, free for all, everybody started thinking about their own standard communication means systems, also based on which funding they could get and which collaboration they could get, which in the end turned out with, yeah, ideally 50, yeah, 36, I think, satellites with completely different systems, completely different data communication standard, protocols, data encoding, all of this turned out to be a mess. So in the end, processing and putting together that data was a real pain. So standardization. Um, that is something where you need to have time in order to agree on something and stick to it, rather than last minute changes as it happened. So yeah, okay, we have two annoying problems already, as we can see, and then but that's the thing, if we start talking now, these are going to take some time to solve the issues and then we can create this uh, wiki pages where we can share and agree on some of the things or the rules or regulations in between us to actually start developing these things. Other, other problem I see or the challenge is that, let's say, if one of us builds the payload, okay, we need to set a certain interface, how other people can do it, then I think the most crucial part is the payload that we develop should be as simple as possible. As in, if all of us need to now build a three-axis uh, attitude determination and control system with one degree pointing in a pocket cube, then we will spend all our money there. So another approach might be we distribute the task. One institution does one payload and the other one does the other, but in the end we get together for the satellites. This is a challenging one, but I mean, these things can just roll slowly and then come to a common sense, hopefully, at the end. So anybody who would like to contribute idea-wise to the constellation, if you're also against it, please also say it. Worst case, I will chase you after the talk. So can we get a discount if you launch a constellation? <laughs> yeah? The, uh, sorry, I pointed to that person already, so I will get back to you. Yeah? Yeah, um, I was just saying, like, so standardization of instruments, yeah, that's good, but you've got to know what the instruments are for. So one of the things you've got to look at, you don't really mention, is the science kits. Yes. Yeah. Um, I believe it should be 50, it's substantially about the comic book. That's yep. Yeah, uh, actually, I completely agree on that. That's why I, um, how do you say, encourage everyone to talk to your fellow scientists around if they would like any in orbit measurement and if we can actually provide it. Then we can build the rest of the requirements and the standards around that. And then I think the very most important one will be how do we share the data instead of how do we build the satellite. That is, that can be more free per institution, but the sharing of the data should be standardized with respect to the science case that we are having so that it can be used by any institution who contributed to the project. So, sorry. By the way, if you have any scientific idea right now, we can also just say it, so at least we are acquainted with the idea. Yeah, go ahead. Just because you just said it right now, 
I mean, most of the science cases that were behind to be fishing are still on the table today. If you look at the three instruments, IMS was a neutral mass uh, spectrometer. So we still don't know uh, what's the density or what, what, is, what are the components of the atmosphere. Well, we have ENSYS, which is a model which is very well known, but it's based on measurements from mass spectrometers from the 80s. And no other instrument has actually come to challenge those measurements still now. So that is still valid. PIPEX was measuring the ratio between atomic oxygen and molecular oxygen. It's still quite a big issue. That instrument was a pain to operate, I can tell you, <laughs> in space. The sensors required to be operated at almost 800 degrees Celsius. So that was quite a pain for the whole mission. MNLP, uh, University of Oslo, built it. They flew six or seven afterwards. We flew them as well in other missions. They still keep flying these, uh, these probes. So most of these instruments, of course, they won't fit. But the, the science behind is still going on. I mean, NASA has plans to fly a constellation in the next decade with 20, I think, mass spectrometers, just because there's no data yet, just to keep in mind. So the problem is still very much uh, yeah, so maybe one idea might be actually, I don't know, uh, I know that these two are challenging to build, but MNLP is rather easier with respect to other two. Get in touch with University of Oslo if they would like to, yeah, so we can check if they would like to get it smaller or we do it together with them. So this creates partially the science case and then everyone else just builds a bucket cube around the payload, so. I mean, there was an, the University of Malta, I think, at a certain point, did a, okay, MNLP is a DC probe. They made an RF sensed uh, ionization probe, which actually fitted on the top of I'm not sure it's blue. But basically, maybe small variations could fit. What's the potential to build a pocket cube bus and then drop in a really small biological Oh. Microfluidics or bacteria. Uh, I know for a fact that you know, we've got some one use that have done that. Right. What about manufacturing in space? You know, some kind of prototype that's the future is manufacturing in space. Can a pocket cube be used to validate some of those technologies? To, to be honest, uh, since I don't know the details of what you're talking, but maybe I would say. So if we start talking about it in detail and then having some, I don't know. Imagine a, a hazardous material that you don't want on the ISS, yeah. but you fly it as a free flyer in a pocket cube. And what do you do with it? Do you deliver it to the ISS or like, or like you choose? I only have two experiences with satellites. One with you know, direct deployment from the top of the Falcon 9 and one was kicked out of the ISS. So oh. I don't know which okay. is better, but... Uh, seems like manufacturing is a field that there's going to be a lot of money to be made in space and people need to hedge their bets you know, reduce their risk. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, the manufacturing part creating as the pocket cube community work uh, constellation would be rather challenging because when you say manufacturing, the first thing comes to my mind is like, I need to move around. If I need to move around, all the pocket cubes need to have either propulsion or some more powerful ADCSs, or I don't know if I can just launch yeah, something. I apologize. And, and yeah, I apologize. I'm imagining a, cube, uh, a number of pocket cubes that are standard buses, but then you have a lot of scientists or others that have very unique payloads. Hmm. So not necessarily formation of a pocket cube, but more the pocket cube that you want to go around and see what you can find. Okay, okay, that one. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. Uh, but I would still, for example, keep the number of science instruments low, as in to create more measurement points for the same thing. Because, like, we can, let's say, measure the mass, uh, the atoms in the atmosphere with one probe. Yes, it will be something. But if we can actually create hundreds of those and then just measure at the same uh, time, that would be a nice model to have. And imagine that this all this constellation is going through the solar storm. Some of them is out. Some of them is in the storm. What happens? Can we see the differences, changes in the atmosphere? I don't know. Even if we can have a basic GPS, and then if we all can provide the raw data, 
there are some people who can actually do more atmospheric science just by using the raw data collected from the GPSs. So this, I think, would be the simplest project that we can tackle. But again, we need more scientific input. What could be this constellation? And then, of course, when we deploy, we are going to deploy, in my opinion, at least 100 pocket cubes. So, yep. That. So this was just my uh, idea that I would like to pitch in. And then please feel free to send an email if you are interested so that, again, we can just create some uh, work groups or email lists and then try to see where to tackle and then one at a time we can actually solve these and eventually apply for a funding that we can launch all together. So thank you for listening and thank you for your attention. So. Thank you.